So I want to essentially start this off with an example. And I'm going to use this example to kind of demonstrate to you various concepts and, and use that running example as a way of demonstrating various concepts inside this probability and statistics module. And so here, we're going to have essentially a two-part random experiment. The part, so this example that I'm going to, that I'm going to do is, so there's gonna be two kind of, there's gonna be, this is a two-part random experiment. The first is that we're gonna have a, a four-sided die. This will be a four-sided die with numbers one, two, three, four. So first I'm going to roll this die this fair four-sided die this is going to be roll four-sided die. And let's say, and, the, and part two is I'm going to flip a coin. Now, the, the, thing, the, the thing about this example is I'm first going to roll a four-sided die, and there's going to be four coins here. It's going to be coin one, two, three, and four. And each of these are biased differently. This, they're biased based on the probability of heads. So this has, this is a two headed coin. So it's as probability of heads of one. This is probably heads of one half, one third, one fourth. And so what I'm going to do here is, so what this random experiment is gonna be, so this, this example is going to be, first I'm going to roll the die Roll die. And then let's say I roll, I'm gonna call this like, let's say V. So V is the, the number that I ro roll. And then I'm going to take coin V and, and flip it. So in other words, how this random experiment is going to work is I, I have a four-sided die Fair four sided die. So each of is there's a probability of one fourth for each of the sides. I'm going to roll it. If I roll a three, I'm going to take coin three and I'm going to flip coin three. So, how I'm going to describe this, how I'm going to model this is I'm first going to do a kind of random variables kind of approach to this, to this problem. And before I even get into like talking, like, you know, writing out all the random variables. I want to give you, do you think it will be useful for me to give you kind of an intuition for how to think about random, random variables? Or do you just want me to like jump in and just model this with random variables? So the first or the second? All right, okay. So a random variable, so this is my way of explaining a random variable. So there, there are different ways of explaining random, random variables, but this is my way of explaining it. And a random variable to me is effectively Think about a box here. You have a box here, and somebody is conducting a random experiment inside. Namely, somebody is like you know rolling a die inside or flipping a coin inside, but you cannot see this person inside doing this random experiment. A random variable. Now, if that were the end of the story, then there wouldn't be much to say about this anymore because you wouldn't be able to see anything. However, there are certain windows. There are like a, there's like a, there, maybe not even a window. There's like a screen here. And what the screen does is it's going to pop up with a number. So it has to pop up with a number. And what this number is, is, th is that this number gives you some information about what the outcome of the random experiment inside was. That screen, this screen is the random variable. Notice that I said that this screen has to pop up with a number. So your random variable cannot you know, come up with values like you know, A, B, C, or something like that. They have to come up with numbers. And what this screen does is this screen gives you some information as to what the outcome of the random experiment inside was. So how I'm going to, so I have now described for you a random experiment here. And I'm now going to give you two random variables essentially two screens, which give you like information about what happened inside. So here, I'm gonna call this X. This is screen X, and this screen is screen Y. 
And what X is, so keep, see, so keep in mind, what happened inside the box is a two-part random experiment. What was this two-part random experiment? I rolled a four-sided die, came out with a number, and based on which number it came out with, let's say it came out with a two, then I took coin two, which is probability of heads of one half, and I flipped the coin, and it came out with heads or tails. This was the random experiment that happened inside. And what are these screens going to tell you? This one is going to tell you the result of the die roll. Of the, so, so this was going to tell you the result of the die roll. I'll, I'll say die roll. And this is the result of the coin. And so here, X is going to just give you the number on the, on the die roll. And for the coin, it's going to give a 1 for heads, a 0 for tails. How am I going to now describe the behavior of these two random variables? The way I'm going to describe the so if you have a like an algebraic variable, like you know, if if you, if you were to like do something like you know two x plus five or something, so here you would have like an algebra, like a variable in algebra. This variable will eff effectively be equal to like a fixed number, right? Because if I did like two x plus five equal to seven, that would mean that like little x here is equal to one. So in algebra, your variables effectively correspond to a certain fixed number. And even if you have like a formula like 2x plus 5 or something like that, your little x is still you know, corresponding to like a fixed number. Because it's like, OK, if I plug in you know, x equals 2, what's going to come out? If I plug in x equals 5, what's going to come out? So effectively, in algebra, when you have variables, these variables represent fixed values. What makes this random variable maybe a little bit more confusing is that the big x does not actually represent a fixed value. In other words, if I want to describe, like, if I want to describe what x is, x can pop up with different values with different probabilities, right? Because if I had to describe the behavior of x, I can't say that you know x is equal to two, x is equal to five, or x is, x is equal to one, or something like that, right? Because x can pop up with different values based on the outcome of what the die roll was. The and so to so how am I so if you just think about how am I going to describe behavior of x? In order to describe completely the, the behavior of this screen, I can't say, you know, this screen is equal to three, because it's not always equal to three. If I roll a four, it's gonna pop up the four. If I roll a one, it's gonna pop up the one. But I can describe the behavior of this screen x by listing out what values it can take on. And what is what corresponding probability that that screen is going to appear with that number? So x can take on four different values. It can take on the value of one, two, three, four, and the corresponding probability that x comes up with a one is one four, two is also one four, three is one four, four is also one four. And this here effectively completely describes the behavior of that screen which is that screen X pops up with a one, one fourth of the time, also the two, one fourth of the time, also the three, one fourth of the time, four, one fourth of the time. This specification is effectively the distribution of X. The distribution of, for a discrete random variable effectively captures what are all the possible uh, values that that random variable can take on with what corresponding probability. Now, we might also want to find the distribution of y. Let's say y. And it's easy to find out what are the two um, values that y can take on. y can either be 1 or 0. But it's probably not so easy to figure out what's the probability that y is equal to 1 and y is equal to 0, because What is the probability that y is equal to one? Like, what's the probability that y that the coin you come up that the coin flip comes up with the heads? It's not so simple because it like kind of depends on which coin you got, right? Like, you can't just say the probability it comes up with heads is like a third because a fourth of the time it's this coin, 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 and so it's probably not immediately clear how to come up with the values here. 
So this brings us to, let's instead, instead of finding out the distribution of Y, let's now find the joint distribution of X and Y. And what is the joint distribution of X and Y? If you think about what the distribution of X is, the distribution of X is that you specify all the possible values that X can take on and their corresponding probabilities. Now, if you have more than one random variable, the joint distribution of X and Y is now I am going to specify every possible combination of values that X and Y can take on and what are those corresponding probabilities. Now, I could do it the same way like this, and I could just list out you know, every possible combination of what x and y can equal to and what's the corresponding probability. But it usually helps to draw this in a more table format. On this side, I'm going to list out the values for y, 1, 0. On this side, I'm going to list out the values for x, 1, 2, 3, 4. And here, I'm going to now write out for you the probability here that I'm going to write out is the probability that y equals 1 x is, and x is equal to 1. The probability here is the probability that y equals 1 x is equal to 2. The probability here is that y equals 1 x is equal to 3, and, and so on. And so you see how this is effectively exactly the same as doing a list like this. Now the list just has to take into account all the possible combination of values of x and y. Here, I listed out all the possible values for x. Here, I've effectively, in this table, made eight boxes for all possible com uh, combinations of values of x and y. And what I'm going to write in the, each of these spaces are the probability that y is equal to this, x is equal to this. So what's the, so what's the probability that x is equal to 1, y is equal to 1? So what's the probability I get a 1 here? That's 1 fourth. So that would be 1 fourth times probability of getting heads times 1. So like 1 fourth here. Here, this would be 1 fourth times 0. The probability of tails, maybe I can write this here, is just 0, 1 half, 2 thirds, 3 fourths. So a fourth times 0, that's 0. A fourth times a half, that's an eighth. A fourth times a half, that's an eighth. X equals three, y equals one. So I flip, I, I roll a three, that's one fourth. I flip heads, that's one third. So one fourth times one third, that's one twelfth. One fourth times two thirds, that's uh, one, one third, one sixth. And then one fourth times one fourth, that's a sixteenth. And then one fourth times three fourths, that's three sixteenths. Is it clear why? And I have thumbs up, middle, thumbs down, how I generated this table. Yeah. Good. Now, what? Now, when I look at this table, it should become this table. Notice how when I have this thing, this really kind of gives me like you know the full like picture of the behavior of X. Right. This table is super useful because it gives me the full picture of what happens for x and y. And why? And so this is the joint distribution. But what I can use this table for is I can use this table to actually find out what's the distribution of x and what's the distribution of y. What is the distribution of x? So what's the probability that x is equal to 1? Well, it's the probability that x is equal to 1 is the probability that this happens plus the probability that this happens. So is a one-fourth probability. If I keep adding all of these up, you will actually realize that all of these add up to a fourth, right? Because, and, and this should make intuitive sense because this is saying, what's the probability x is equal to two? Well, it's the probability that x is two, y is one, plus the probability x is two, y is zero. So this whole thing gives you the probability that x is equal to two. Now, what this table also lets me do is it lets me figure out what these two probabilities are. What's the probability that y is equal to 1? It's this plus this plus this plus this. And I've pre-computed this value. It's 25 over 48. 
What's the probability y is equal to zero? This plus this plus this plus this, this should be 23 over 48. And so I can fill this out here. This middle section here, this is the joint distribution of x and y. These edges down here, this is the marginal distribution. of x, this here would be the marginal distribution of y. I'm now going to do some that is the top still visible in the zoom. Okay. So now I'm going to give you sort of these like summary statistics about random variables x and y. So I'm going to calculate for you the expected value, the, the expected value and the variance of some of these random variables. There are multiple ways to calculate the expected value of a random variable. And so what's really, what I think will be helpful for you is that over the course of this example, I'm going to give you different ways of calculating the expected value and the variance. And what will help is that it, I haven't organized these in like a nice little table, but I think what will help for you is you just make a, a, a place that says like ways to calculate expected value. And as I like run into them, I will let you know, and you can add them to the list. And that way you will just have like in your study like sheet a like a list of ways to like find the expected value, a list of ways to find the variance. And that way, like if you're on a test or something or you're doing a problem, you can just like pop down like, you know, the various methods and figure out which one is most convenient for you. So here I'm going to introduce for you the first uh, method for calculating the expected value. And this is effectively just like directly from the definition, which is that how do I calculate the expected value of X? I take each value, I multiply it by the probability and I sum all of those terms up. Expected value of x is therefore, I'm going to take each value multiplied by, by the probability and sum all of those terms up. Value one times probability one fourth plus value two times probability one fourth plus value three times probability one fourth plus value four times probability one fourth. And this equals to 10 over four, which is five halves. I want to do for you a, maybe a more general example. In x, you have a uniform distribution equal probability of one, two, three, and four. I'm gonna give you a different random variable, u, which is uniform from one to n. This would have an equal probability of one, two, three, four, five, up to n. So what does this look like? This u takes on the values one, two, three, up to n. And since the probabilities need to sum to one and they're all the same, therefore they all have probability one over n. How am I going to calculate the expected value of u now? Well, it will be 1 times 1 over n plus 2 times 1 over n, all the way up to n times 1 over n. I'm going to write this in a summation form. I'm going to sum from i equals 1 to n of i times 1 over n. Notice the 1 over n doesn't depend on i, so I can pull it out of the sum. 1 over i times sum i equals 1 to n of i. What is this sum? This is simply the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to n. This sum you may recognize as being n times n plus 1 over 2, and therefore the n's cancel, and that gives me n plus 1 over 2. You can see that this formula agrees with this one for n equals 4. Here I had 4, I went from 1 to 4, so n equals 4, and the expected value was four plus one over two, which is five halves. Now I'm going to calculate for you the variance of x. So now so what is the variance of x? I'm going to give you a few different ways. Um, what is the actual definition of the variance of x? It is Consider x minus expected value of x squared. The variance of x, in effect, has to measure the spread of the random variable, like sort of like how like how spread out are these values 
for this random variable. If you had like very low probability here and like very concentrated probability right here, then this would have very low variance because it's very little spread. If your uh, random variable could like, you know, is like equal like this, then there's probably quite a lot of spread because there's, you know, here's the mean, but you're kind of spread out over here and you're spread over here. But if your distribution looked like something like that, then it was very little spread because, you know, essentially all the probabilities is concentrated right here. The intuition behind this x minus expected value of x is how far, so this here is actually a random variable. We're just saying, how far is my x from the mean? How far is my x screen from the mean? And the reason I want to square it is because if x is less than, like, I'm, I, I don't really care if it's less than or bigger than the mean. I just want to figure out the, like, kind of, I want to have a measure of, like, the distance from the mean kind of thing. And so the reason why it's squared is because if I'm less than the mean, it would be negative. If I'm bigger than the mean, it's positive. But if it's squared, then it's all positive. And so this, in effect, gives you kind of a measure of the like square distance from the mean. What variance of x is, is it's the expected value of this. Now, this could actually be kind of confusing because like, wh what, is, what is this? What, what is this thing even in the middle? Now, the thing in the middle, that is a random variable. This is actually another random variable. I'm going to call this random variable. I'll, I'll give it a name like, let's say R. And what's R? R is a random variable. Now, I want you now to think back to the, um, to the, idea of a random variable being like a screen. Keep in mind, you have an X screen here, which pops out, you know, one, two, three, four, each with one fourth probability. What is this R random variable? Expected value of X, this is just a number. In fact, this number here is five halves. So what this is, is this is actually the expected value of X minus five halves square. What is this, this random variable R? What is this random variable R? This is saying, this random variable R is that whatever my X screen pops up with, my R screen is going to pop up with that number minus five halves all square. So if my X screen were to pop up with a one, my R random variable would pop up with one minus five halves all square. In other words, my R random variable will pop up with how far is my X value from the mean squared? The square distance of the X value from its mean. <laughs> Maybe there's like a little bit, do people want me to say that, say that again? Oh, okay, good. Um, but calculating it this way is often hard. Because that means that I now have to write out the distribution of R. So I have to list out all the you know, values of R, their corresponding probabilities, and then do this kind of thing again, which is probably like kind of annoying. So here I'm going to introduce to you the second like alternate method of, of calculating the variance. And this is equal to, so I'm gonna expand this out x squared minus 2 e of x, x plus expected value of x squared. I'm going to use now linearity of expectation. I'm going to split this up. This is e of x squared minus 2 e of x. These are both numbers. e of x, remember, is a number. It's 5 halves. So 2 times e of x, that's still a number. So I can, I can pull it out of the expectation. 2e of x, this is a number, times expected value of this random variable, x. And then plus, this is the expected value of, what is this? This is not random at all. This is a number. Expected value of x is a number. Expected value of x squared is a number. It's in fact 25 over 4. So what's the expected value of 25 over 4? Just 25 over 4. So the expected value of a number is just a number. So the expected value of this number is just this number. Expected value of x squared. 
Now, what do I have here? This is two times expected value of x squared plus one of expected value of x squared. So one of this minus two of it. So I have still here expected value of x squared minus two times this plus one of this. So minus expected value of x squared. So here, what I get to do is now I get to, what I have to do is I have to calculate this expected value and I have to calculate this. This is probably easy to calculate because you already know what expected value of x is. That's 5 halves. And you also need to figure out what this is. What is the expected value of x squared? So now I have to go back and write out the distribution of x squared. What is the distribution of x squared? Now, if you go back to the screen analogy, you go back to the screen analogy, what is... If I have a screen which is x, what is the x squared screen? The x squared screen pops up with whatever x pops up with squared. So if I roll a 2, my x screen is going to pop up with a 2, and my x squared screen is going to pop up with a 4. If I roll a 3, my x screen is going to pop up with a 3. My x squared screen is going to pop up with 3 squared 9. So my x squared screen pops up with whatever number x pops up with that squared. And so now I'm going to list out what are the possible values for x squared. Well, x can take on four different values, one, two, three, four. And x squared, all this screen does is it just pops up with the number that x pops up with, but except it's squared. So x squared takes whatever number x pops up with, and it displays its square. So when x displays one, x squared is going to display one. When x displays two, x squared is going to display 4. When x displays 3, x squared is going to display 9. When x displays 4, x squared is going to display 16. Each of these are going to have probability 1 fourth. What is now the expected value of x squared? The expected value of x squared is 1 times a fourth plus 4 times a fourth plus 9 times a fourth plus 16 times a fourth, and let's see, this is 1, 5, 14, 30. So this is 30 over 4, or 15 halves. So this would be 15 halves minus 5 halves squared. And we can probably calculate this out. 15 over 2 minus 25 over 4. 30 over, so this would be 5 over 4. I, th I think this should be. I think this should be right. Okay. Anything that yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, any other way to calculate expected value, or do you have to write every term out? Um. So other than writing out every term, probably the other way is just by linearity of x. Linear, linearity of expectations. Um, so I can, I'm actually, there's probably the next example, so I can I can demonstrate that one as, as well. So I'm going to move over to this, this board. Um, and let's say here I have, let's say here I actually have a random variable z. And this random var variable z is going to describe a random experiment, a different random experiment. And what this random experiment is, is I'm no longer going to just flip this coin once. I'm going to flip this coin n times. So what this, So I'm now going to flip coin n times. Um, actually, no. I'm going to not flip. Let, let, me, let me not say flip the coin n times. I'm going to say. I'm going to now repeat this experiment n times. So not, not just flip the coin n times. I'm going to do, you know, roll the die, flip the coin once. Roll the die, flip the coin second time. I'm going to do that n times. I'm going to repeat this experiment n times. And z represents 
the number of heads I see. So I'm going to do this experiment once, twice, third time, fourth time. I'm going to do, repeat it n times. And Z, what the Z screen is going to tell me is Z is going to tell me how many heads did I see. Now, it's probably really complicated now to write out the distribution completely of what Z is. However, I can split this up into a sum of random variables. And I'm repeating this experiment n times. Right, so z is equal to z equal to y one. Y one represents how many heads I got on the first run of the experiment. Plus y two, how, how many heads I got on the second run of the experiment. So it's either one or zero. Plus y three, how many heads I got on the third run of the experiment, one or zero, all the way up to y n. This here, this is the Digimote principle. All right, it's the fact that I've taken this random variable and split it up as a sum of you know constituent random variable. And why did I split it up as a sum? So this is effectively the second way of calculating expected value, which is that first you first you use the Digimote principle. First you use the first you split it up as the sum of small of, of other random variables, and then you use linearity of expectation. So to calculate expected value of z, what is z? z is the sum of this. So this is the expected value of y1 plus y2 plus up to yn. I use linear expectation, expected value of y1 plus expected value of y2 all the way up to expected value of yn. What is the expected value of y1? Well, it's just exactly well, y1 has the same distribution as y, y2 is the same distribution as y, all the way up to yn. So all of these expected values have the same distribution, which is that. So they're all going to be the same. So I can simplify this as being n times the expected value of y. What's the expected value of y? So this is n times what's the expected value of y? 1 times 25 over 48. Ooh plus 0 times 23 over 48. This gives me n times 25 over 48. I want to give a second example now for calculating the variance. So if I variance of z, so what are the methods for expected value? There was this one, and there was the split up one. What's the ways for calculating variance of a random variable? There was this way, which is, this is probably like your least preferred method. There was this way, which is probably more preferred. But here, if I were to use that, expected value of z squared minus expected value of z all squared, this would be horrible. You, would, you really don't want to write out the distribution of expected value of z squared. So I could say this. But this would be horrible because you would have to write out the distribution of this. <laughs> the other way to do this is notice that z is a sum of independent random variables. If I've conducted this experiment n times and they're all independent of each other, if z is a sum of independent random variables, then the variance of z can be described as the variance of y1 plus the variance of y2 plus you know, up to the variance of yn. So this only works for independent you know, y1, y2, up to yn, or like mutually independent y1, y2, up to yn. What's the variance of y1? Now for the variance of y1, I can use my previous method expected value of y1 squared minus expected value of y1 all squared. <laughs> expected value of y1 here, this is, I calculated this here, that's 25 over 48. What's this? Well, what's y1 squared? What does y1 squared look like? Well, I have to square each of the values of y1 and have the corresponding probabilities. So, what's the, so y1 can click on two values, 
one squared, zero squared. So it can take on one squared, zero squared. And it takes on one squared with probability 25 over 48. Zero squared with probability 23 over 48. So you realize the expected value of this. One times this plus zero times this. That's equal to 20. So this part is also equal to 25 over 48. Which therefore is equal to 25 over 48 minus 25 over 48 squared. 25 over 48 times 1 minus 25 over 48. I'm just factoring it out. So I can get this. And so the total variance here, each of these variances are the same. So n times 25 over 48 times 23 over 48. Notice here, if I change this, so notice here actually, this, this random variable y, y1, is actually a Bernoulli random variable with probability 25 over 48. And if you follow the same derivation here, you will realize that the variance of a Bernoulli variance for a Bernoulli random variable of probability P is equal to P times one minus P. And you can see that right here, P times one minus P. Therefore, what is Z here? Z is a sum of independent Bernoulli var random variables. Z is therefore, this is a binomial random variable. N trials, probability of success P. And so, and so what's the variance of a binomial random variable? N trials, probability of success P is N times the variance of one of these Bernoulli random variables, P times one minus P. Everything, so thumbs up, thumbs down, any, any part of this that you want to hear again. Yeah. On the, on the test, we like just know that it's a binomial distribution. Could we just like write that the variance the formula and set up? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Okay. yeah. But I wanted to derive this, but you should also know how to derive this because I think this is sort of like the simplest example of like linearity of expectation. Yeah. And so I think other examples where you have to use linear of expectation were more difficult than this. So it's good to know this, this proof. Any, any other questions about this so far? I will, I don't think. Okay, I want. Can you explain how you got expected value of pi one squared? Can sure. Yeah, expected value. Of, so, is it clear why this is the distribution of y one squared? So, I just calculated it in the standard way, which is I take the value multiplied by the probability plus the value multiplied by the probability. So, one times twenty five over forty eight plus zero times twenty three over forty eight is equal to twenty five over forty eight. So, is it okay if I erase this, this bottom, this bottom part? Okay. Well, I'm going to erase this, and I'm going to now, um, I'm I'm now going to go into talking about covariance and correlation. I <laughs> I'm talking about everything else. I wonder if I'm looking at this. 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 I'm looking
Yeah, you stuck in the middle. I'm still going to keep these two random variables here, x and y. And now I'm going to calculate you what is the covariance of x and y. And what is the, so first I want to, so remember how when you calculate the variance, there was like, it was like this expected value of like x minus e of x all squared. And then like, that was like, that kind of gave you like the intuitive sense, which is like, you know, like on average, what's the square distance from the mean? But it wasn't like very amenable to like calculation because like that x minus x, e of x all squared is like, is like, you know, kind of a really annoying random variable to deal with. And so there's like a more convenient way, which is the e of x squared minus expected value of x all squared. This is a similar thing that's going to happen with covariance. So I'm first going to give you the intuition for what it means, what covariance means, and then give you the formula, which is like, you know, convenient to calculate kind of formula. So what is the covariance of X and Y? Let's think about X minus expected value of X, this time not squared. So this actually tells you how far X is above its mean and, it act, and the sign of it, of x minus expected value of x, tells you whether or not x is above the mean or below the mean. <laughs> and then multiply this by y minus expected value of y. Similar, this not only tells you how far y is from the mean, it also tells you, the sign tells you whether it's above the mean or below the mean. And then I'm going to take the expected value of all of that. So intuitively, what does this say? This is, a, this is saying, on average, what is this product of x minus its expected value times y minus its expected value? And it's perhaps most meaningful if I only analyze its sum. If the covariance is positive, what does that mean? That means that on average, these two terms, this term and this term, if the covariance is positive, that means sometimes, so this is the, so remember the covariance is the average value of this, right? So like half the time, this value is bigger than that covariance. Half the time, this value is less than its covariance. So what does it mean if the covariance is positive? That means that at least half the time, that value inside this thing, this product, is bigger than the covariance, which means it's positive. So that means that if the covariance is positive, this value, more likely than not, is going to be positive. The covariance is positive, this value, this product, I'm going to use some non-rigorous language here, tends to be positive. What does it mean for this product to, you know, more likely than not to be positive? When is a product positive? It's so when the individual terms have the same sign. If I'm saying that this product tends to be positive, that means these two terms tend to have the same sign. More often than not, these two terms have the same sign. What that means is that when this is positive, this is probably more often than not, this is probably positive. And when this is negative, this one you know, tends to be negative. So this is not saying that when this is positive, this is definitely positive. That's not what I'm saying. This is saying when this is positive, this one, like these two terms, <coughs> more often than not, usually have the same sign. Now, what does it mean for this? So, so these two things, you know, tend to happen. Now, what does it mean for this and this to tend to both be positive? That means that when X is above its mean, Y also tends to be above its mean. You think about, here, these are the different values of, of, of what x can be. And these are the different values of what y can be. When x is above its mean, and, and let's say here, this is the mean, this is the mean. When x is above its mean, y also tends to be above its mean. So you have something like that's going on here. 
and x is less than the mean, y tends to be less than the mean. And you can see here why this, uh, this means that x and y intuitively are positively correlated. Which positively correlated just means that when x gets big, y also tends to you know, rise with it. When x goes you know, small, y also tends to fall with it. So that's like the intuition behind, behind it. So this is like x and y you know, tend to grow together. When the covariance is negative, you have the opposite effect. That means that this term and this term tend to have opposite signs, which means that as x, x gets bigger than its mean, because if opposite signs now, y tends to get smaller than its mean. So if these two are positively correlated or negative, you tend to have something like this. So that means that x and y tend to grow, tend to go in opposite directions. When the covariance is negative, if x gets big, y tends to go down. And the other way, if x gets small, y also tends to increase. Now, using this to count, now calculating the covariance with that is annoying because now you have to literally, like, you know, write out the distribution of this joint. You have to literally write out the joint distribution of this kind of random variable. And, yes. Like, and like, Actually, not the joint distribution. You have to write out the distribution of this random variable and then you know multiply out, calculate all the probabilities, and then you know, multiply them all out. That like doesn't sound good. So I'm going to now take this expression, e of x minus e x, y minus e y. And I'm going to expand out the inside. Remember, these are actually, you should treat these essentially as numbers, these as random variables. So I have e of x, that's a number, times y, minus e of y, that's a number, times x, plus e of x, e of y. Both of these are numbers. Now, we use linearity of expectation. Oh, this should be xy. Um, e of xy minus. That's a number, it comes out. And then I take the expected value of y minus, this is a number. I take the expected value of this, x plus this. This is both a number, so the expected value of a number is just the number itself. Notice this and this will cancel, and I have expected value of xy minus expected value of x, expected value the expected value of x and the expected value of y I've already calculated. Expected value of x, I believe we calculated, or I might have erased it, but it should be five halves. Expected value of y, we calculated, I'll leave calculate over here, but I, I'll just, it's 25 or 48. What's the expected value of x, y? Well, I still have to write out the distribution of x, y. but this is going to be a lot easier. What is the distribution of x, y? Let's think about it this way. You have a screen x, you have a screen y. What does your x, y screen pop up with? It's if x pops up with two, y pops up with one, then my x, y screen is going to pop up with two times one, two. If x pops up with two, y pops up with zero, then my x, y screen is going to pop up with a zero. And so what are the possible values for x, y to take on? Well, it could be one and one, two and one. So if it's one and one, it's going to pop up with a one. If it's two and one, it's going to pop up with a two. Three and one, it's going to pop up with a three. Four and one, it's going to pop up with a four. But if y is zero, it's going to pop up with a zero. So x, y can pop up with five different values, zero, one, two, three, and four. When does an x, y screen pop up with a one? Precisely when x is one and y is one. That has probably one fourth, if you look at that table of happening. When does x, y pop up with a two? That happens exactly when x is two, y is one. If you look at the table, that has a one eighth chance of happening. One sixteenth, uh, no, not one sixteenth, one twelfth. 
1 16th. And then when does zero come up, which is X can be anything but Y is zero. That's when X, Y is zero. That comes up with, if you look at the second, if you look at the Y to zero row, that comes up 23 over 48. How do I calculate now the expected value of X, Y? You just do exactly the same procedure as before. Zero times this, one times this. So, so you, you know, take all these products and then, you know, you, you just like sum them all up and that gets you your expected. Okay. Any any questions about about this this table? Can I have thumbs up, thumbs down about like how clear this this table makes sense? Okay. okay, good. Now there's a now there's one catch about this covariance, which is that it doesn't actually. Remember I told you that when covariance is positive, that means x, y tend to grow together. But I didn't tell you how strong that tendency was. I just said that, you know, more often than not, you know, these two things are going to have the same sign. But I didn't tell you how strong the, like, you can, you can imagine the x, y, like, if they're very, very, like, you know, tightly, you know, intertwined with each other, then when x grows, you know, y definitely grows. Or, you know, when X gets big, Y definitely gets big. Or it could be like weakly, you know, intertwined, which is that like, you know, X, when X gets big, Y, you know, more often than not gets big, but then like, you know, doesn't really track X that well. Notice how like, I only said that these two things tend to grow, but I didn't tell you how strong that tendency was. And what you should, and, and one thing also that I hope will make intuitive sense to you is that the covariance of X x, y equals zero when x and y are independent. I'm not going to prove this to you for the sake of time, but this is a useful fact, you know, and I hope like the intuitive part at least like kind of makes sense, which is that this is like x and y kind of track each other and they grow together. This is like they track each other in the, in, in the opposite way. And so I hope it's clear that these two sort of give you an intuitive feeling that X and Y are not independent because as X gets big, Y tends to like, you know, more often than not get big. So covariance of X and Y is equal to zero. That means that X and Y are, are, are independent with each other. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this, this is actually a fact. And another fact that could be useful is the covariance of x, x is equal to the variance of x. If you take the covariance of a random variable with itself, that is equal to the variance. And you can see that by plugging in x right here, I get expected value of x minus e of x times x minus e of x, and that would equal to expected value of x minus e of x squared, which is exactly the formula for the variance. I'm going to return to that catch that I talked to you about, which is that this covariance doesn't actually tell you how strong that kind of relationship is. And you might think, oh, like bigger covariance probably means that it means stronger relationship. Sort of true, but I can also just artificially inflate my covariance by just making the random variables take on huge values. You can imagine now that if I, instead of doing one, two, three, and four, I instead make my, my X, instead of doing one, two, three, and four, what if I made it 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, and 4 million? Then this expected value, when I calculate it out, this expected value of X is no longer five halves. It's probably going to be like, you know, like 5 million over two or something like that. And this expected value X, Y is here. I can make this covariance really, really big simply by artificially inflating the values of X and like artificially just inflating the values of Y. So like I can just make X like, you know, 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, Y to be like 1 million and zero. And this covariance thing, it's going to get huge. But does that mean that this, like the X and Y interrelationship suddenly got really, really strong? Well, not really. Really effectively, you have the same thing. 
right? I just artificially inflated all the values to make this covariance really big. So I can't, so the size of the covariance isn't actually, doesn't actually tell you how strong the relationship is unless you also know how big your individual random variables are, right? If your individual random variables take on huge values, you're going to get big covariance, but that doesn't mean there's a strong relationship. It could just mean that you just have huge values for X or huge values for Y. So somehow to, we have to now capture the strength of that relationship between X and Y and take into account, you know, like how big were these random variables X and Y. And so that gives the correlation. I'm going to you know, maybe just write it right here. Um, I'm going to write the correlation right here. So the correlation, x and y, is the same thing as the covariance. And so now I'm going to divide out by the square root of variance of x times variance of y. And what that does is that if you have huge values of x, that variance is also going to get big. If you have huge values of y, this variance is also going to get, going to get big. So in effect, this variance x, variance y term is kind of like capturing how big your, the values of your random variable are. And so by dividing out by this, I like to say it's like, it like normalizes it out. It like tells you how big your covariance is relative to the size of your random variables. Your correlation, therefore, your correlation always lies between negative one and one, one means that you are perfectly positively correlated. X and Y tend to grow together, you know, like they're perfectly coupled. Negative one means X and Y are perfectly negatively coupled. And correlation of zero again means that X and Y are independent. So this negative one to one effectively tells you how strong that kind of like tie between X and Y are. Yeah. So the closest they're to zero, the less they're correlated? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. I want to take some time to do for you the probability. Uh, is, is it okay if I, I, I don't want to, like, because I, I, I want to have enough time for, for the other, other sections. So I, I want to, um, if possible, I want to move on to the, to the probability inequalities. Um, maybe I will, oh, so I'm not going to make use of this running example here anymore. So I'm going to now, I'm going to erase this. so my first example here is 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 going to be Markov's inequality. And what this says is that if x, <laughs> x is non-negative, in other words, x cannot take on negative values, so it has to be zero or bigger. The probability that x is bigger than alpha, less than or equal to the expected value of x over alpha. I can give you a quick example of this. Let's say I flip a coin. Um, let's say I flip a coin n times. Uh, so I can give you a quick example of this. Let's say I flip a coin 
with probability of so it has probability of heads of two thirds. And I'm going to do this n times without deriving all of that again. This would be a binomial, and let's let's say x is the number of heads. This would be a bin so x would be binomial. N trials, probability of success two thirds. And let's say like I can put some numbers here actually. Let's say I flipped it a hundred times. <laughs> and so you I think they're just kind of like, like annoying. Let's do three fourths. Or actually, I mean, I'll pick it one fourth. So this is like bias three fourths toward tails. And you might want to say, like, how, like, you probably aren't going to get over 50. Probably aren't going to get over 50 um, <laughs> heads. Because this thing is like, is probably one fourth of getting head. So, like, you probably are pretty low probability that you're going to get over 50 heads. How, how would I bound that probability? How small is that probability? Well, what's the expected value of x? Well, the expected value of x is n times p, 100 times a fourth, 75. What's my alpha? I want to figure out what's the probability. I want to figure out how small is this probability that I get over half, like 50, over 50. So alpha will be 50, right? Because I want to see how when x is bigger than 50. So the probability that x is bigger than 50, less than or equal to expected value of x, 25 over 50, a half. Okay, this bound is really bad. But it does tell you that, okay, there is a less than half chance that I'm going to get over 50, 50 heads. So, I mean, one thing you should know is that the, this Markov bound is really, really loose. It's really, it's a really, really bad bound. But it does like, okay, it does say like your X bigger than 50 is going to be, a, it is, it is going to be less than a half chance you're going to get over 50. But in, 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 in reality, I believe the probability is much, much smaller than that. For the other two, I believe there are two other ones. There's Chebyshev's inequality and Hufting's inequality. I want to give you a, so I'm actually going to erase this because this book bound is so bad, but you should, you, but you should remember the, you, you should remember the formula because I like, there is a good chance it, it, it will come up, but I'm going to erase this and I'm going to give you an example. This example is, I think a little bit hard to understand, but it might be interesting. Like, because I think it's something that you probably will have like somehow, it probably would have like ventured into your brain at some point. And what this example is, is let's say I give you a coin and you don't know whether it's biased heads or tails. In fact, you want to find out how much it's biased towards heads, how much it's biased towards tails. Like, you know, what's the probability of heads? You don't know whether it's like a fair coin or it's, you know, heavier on the heads that you don't, you don't know, but you want to find out. So what would you probably do? You'd probably, what you would probably do if you don't know, you know, the probability is you probably just like keep flipping this thing many, 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 many times, right? And you're going to flip it many, many, many times. And you're going to, and, and you're probably just going to count up how many heads there are divided by the number of flips you did. And that's, you're going to guess, okay, that's probably going to be the probability of heads. And you probably like, if you like had the patience for it, you probably would just take this coin and just flip it like a thousand times, count up the number of heads, and then say like, you know, if I got like 500 heads, oh, it's probably like a fair coin. If I got 200 heads, it's probably like, you know, one fifth probability of heads. And, and like your intuition probably says that, you know, if you flip it like a lot of times, like a hundred, like, like a thousand times, you probably are like pretty close to the right probability. And in fact, that's kind of what the law of large numbers says which is that if you flip something many, 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 like up to an infinite number of times, 
this value kind of tends toward exactly what the mean is. Now, what you might be interested in knowing is like, what if someone told you, I need you to predict the probability, you know, up to a certain amount of error. You have to get within the, like, somebody knows the right probability and you have to come up with the, pro like, you have to come up with that probability and you can't be more than a certain amount off. So let's say they hand you like a, like a so, so let's say you have a coin here and it has probability heads equals to, actually this is, let's say you have a coin here, probability heads is equal to P. You don't know what P is. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna start flipping this coin kind of thing. You're gonna start flipping this coin. And let's say that the person tells you, you can't be more than epsilon. And, and so you're, you're going to, you're going to flip it many, many times. And then you're going to do that exact strategy, which is I don't know how many heads divide by total number of flips. And that's going to be your guess for what P is. Now, what this person tells you is that you have to be within epsilon. So your prediction has to be within epsilon of P. Namely, like, like you get it right if you are inside the p minus epsilon to p plus epsilon. So if the p, if this is your true probability, if you guess probabilities within this range, you're good. Now, what you might want to find out is how many times do I need to flip this coin in order to get inside range p minus epsilon, p plus epsilon? How many times do I need to get like, like how many times do I need to flip this coin in order to get in range? For this, I'm going to calculate for you. I'm going to calculate this two different ways. One with Chebyshev's inequality, one with Hufting's inequality. And I think what you will find is, I think the Hufting one gives you the better bound, which is that you actually, Hufting actually guarantees that you can flip less times than what you would have calculated with Chevy Chef. But I'm going to calculate them both for you. How many, so what you might want to ask is how many times do I have to flip this coin so that my prediction, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to land in this range. Okay, so here is how I'm going to model this situation. I'm going to use a random variable. So let's say x, xi, this is the i flip. This is a random variable, one, zero, one for heads, zero for tails. This occurs with probability P. This occurs with probability one minus P. I'm going to give you another random variable. The second random variable is going to just, is going to be what is your predicted probability? What's your predicted P after n flips? So I'm going to label Z. This is your predict. This is a random variable describing your predicted probability after n flips. And what is that? Well, this is the sum of xi. Right, so this captures how many heads. And I'm going to divide it by the total number of trials, n trials. I'm going to divide it by n trials. So notice how this random variable z here is describing after n trials, what would you have? What is the predicted probability after n flips? Now, keep in mind z is a random variable, because if you know your n flips could have you know many many different outcomes, and each of those different outcomes are you're going to predict a different probability. So z is a random variable which is described in this way. What I want now, what's expected value of z? Expected value of z. Now I'm going to use linearity of expectation is the expected value of one over n times the sum. Pull this constant out, one over n times the sum of expected value of xi. What's the expected value of xi? I can calculate this very quickly. One times p plus zero times one minus p. 
that's equal to p. Now p plus p plus p plus p n times, that's n times p. So this sum here is n times p. I have a one over n, n's cancel, I get p. So what is my expected value of z is precisely the true probability, the true probability of getting hence. The expected value of this random variable z. So this random variable z is if you were to you know, do this trial, do this experiment, and flip this coin n times, and then count out the number of heads divided by the number of trials, that's the value of z that will pop up. And that's what and z is a random variable because you can have different outcomes for your sequence of n flips. But what's your expected value of z is in fact the true probability that your coin lands on heads. What do you now want to bound? You want to bound probability z minus expected value of z. You want z minus expected value z, your predicted probability minus the true probability this absolute value to be less than epsilon. Remember, I don't want to be epsilon off of the true probability. I don't want my prediction to be epsilon off of the true probability. I'm now going to state for you the uh, two inequalities that um, we're going to use. I'll, I'll state for you the, the two inequalities. So the so Chebyshev's inequality says that this is Chebyshev. is the probability that x differs from its mean by more than alpha is less than or equal to variance of x divided by alpha squared. So what this is saying is the probability that x is out is away from its mean. The probability that if this is the expected value of x, if this is the like distribution of x, the probability that it's alpha away from its mean, more than alpha away from its mean. So this probability is less than that. And the Hufting bound says that if I have random variables x1, x2, up to xn, and all of these random variables have are essentially lie between this one between a i b i uh, a one b one this one between a two b two this one up to a n b n what this is saying is i'm saying x one takes on value can only take on values inside a one to b one x two can only take on values inside a two to b two x n can only take on values inside a two to a n to b n so namely geometric random variables are not going to work because geometric random variables don't actually have a1, b1, because they can go off to infinity. Right, so these have to be bounded random variables. Then if I consider Sn, which is the sum of these random variables, the probability that this sum differs from its expected value It's like this by more than t is less than or equal to. Let me just write this expression out. E to the negative two t squared. So t is this like, like that kind of like your this t is functionally like the epsilon kind of thing. 
t, 2t squared divided by the sum of all of these kind of like interval lengths, b1 minus a1 squared plus b2 minus a2 squared all the way up to bn minus a n squared. I believe it, I believe sn is, I believe this is absolute value, but I can, I can check. I'm pretty sure this is this this, but like I'm looking at the slides and it doesn't have an absolute value. So I might just take it off for now. But I think I think the absolute value should be there. Okay. Okay. I can, I can check I can check once more like on Wikipedia and oh okay um oh, yeah so so the slides are correct but there's no absolute value but I'm still going to show you yeah. how I can use the non-absolute value to, to, to come up with the balance. First though, keep in mind here, so if, you, so if you recall the situation that was going on right here, was have this coin of unknown bias, and flip it many, many, many times, count up the heads, divide by the number of trials, that's gonna be my predicted probability. And I want to not be far off from the true probability p. Notice here, Chebyshev's inequality kind of gives you exactly what we need, which is that it's less than or equal to the variance of z divided by alpha, in this case, would be epsilon squared. Now, what's the variance of z? Keep in mind all of these. I'm going to calculate very quickly the variance of z or the variance of z, that's the variance of this times. Now, remember, the variance of a constant times something, times a random variable, is equal to that constant squared. So you can bring the constant out, but you have to square it times the variance of the sum. And then because these are independent, this is equal to one over n squared times the sum of the variances. And what is the variance of this? This is a Bernoulli random variable probability of success p. And so I'm just going to tell you it's going to be one over n squared times the sum from i equals one to n. This is a Bernoulli random variable probability of success p. So it should be p times one minus p. And there are n of these, so this plus this plus this is n of these. So that equals to one over n squared times n times p times one minus p. This cancels and I get p one minus p over n. So what is this equal to? This is equal to p one minus p over n epsilon squared. I'm going to introduce to you another. Huh? Yeah. Why is it less than or equal to epsilon on like that side? Oh, side? yeah, yeah. This should be greater than. It. So, so in, in, so I want to, so I want to be within range. So here, what I'm doing is I'm bounding the probability of failure. Z minus P outside of the range, outside of range. Right? This is the probability of failure. So this is probability of failure. And I want to say, this probability of failure is at most this. Now, I'm going to introduce for you one more variable. And I'm going to introduce for you a variable delta. And this is the kind of like max probability of failure. What delta is, is like, how sure do you have to be that you really are in range? How sure do you have, like if delta 
is like 0.1, that means I have to be 90% sure that I'm in range. But if delta were like, you know, 0.00001, I'd be like 99.999% sure I'm in range. So delta, if you make delta really small, that means that you, you, are, you, you want to be really, really confident that you are in range. Keep in mind that affects how many times you have to flip. Because if you want to be really, really, really sure you're in range, you probably have to flip this coin like many, 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 many times. So what I want is I need P of one minus P over N epsilon squared to be less than equal to delta, right? So this is my probability of failure. Chevy Chev's inequality says this is less than equal to this. And I want to make sure that this is still less than delta. So I want to make sure my probability of failure, I know this is less than this, and I need to make sure this is less than delta, which guarantees that this probability of failure will be underneath delta. So there are two kind of like, you know, little things here. Epsilon tells you how far off do you have, like what's the permissible range of probabilities that you're still like, okay. Delta is what's your maximum probability of failure. And so here I can actually solve for this. N has to be bigger than or equal to P times one minus P over delta times epsilon squared. And actually, p times 1 minus p, this, this term, I'm not going to derive it, but this term is always less than or equal to a fourth. So that means that uh, so actually, I'll, I'll just keep it like this for now. Oh, OK. Uh, so yeah, so p times 1 minus p is actually at most a fourth, which means that if this is at most a fourth, then as long as I get n bigger than one over four delta epsilon squared, then I'm good. What I'm saying here is, so, so you notice here that it, it, like, it seems like it depends on p. But in fact, if p is really small, if p is really small, then like, you know, like if p is really small, then like my bound on n is really weak because this thing is really small. So I want to find like what's the worst possible scenario for all the p's. If you graph this p times 1 minus p, you'll actually get something like it looks like this, 0, 1, and this is p times 1 minus p. So the worst case scenario is actually right here at a half. And so this has to be, this is less than a 4. And so this is the, this, at this point, this is like, the worst possible thing, because this means that my n has to be even bigger than that. And so this is at most a fourth. So I'm saying that n has to be bigger than one over four delta times epsilon squared. And so don't worry too much about this, you know, these little like details here, but I want to show you why this kind of has some intuitive, it, it kind of makes intuitive sense. Epsilon is telling me how much like, how far off can I get from the probability? If I want to be more accurate, epsilon is smaller. Epsilon yes. squared is tiny. One over epsilon squared is big. That means I have to flip more times. If I want delta to be small, I want the probability of failure to be small. I can make delta smaller. One over delta gets big. I have to flip more times. So this formula really shows you how, like, based on these probabilities of failure, how far off, like how many times you, you need to flip before you can be this certain with high probabilities, with low probability of failure. Hopefully that like sort of makes sense. This actually comes up in like, you know, if you, if you go off and, and take like, you know, more classes and like randomized algorithms or something, this is a very simple example of a probably approximately correct algorithm to, to determine the probability of this coin. You are approximately right most of the time. <laughs> Going to now do the other one, 
if I were to now have Huffing's inequality, no, I only did like what I now let's do uh okay so now let's try to do this for Huffing's inequality. So again I want to bound probability of that z minus expected value of z is less than or equal to epsilon. So remember, this first one was a bound that we did using Chebyshev's inequality. Now I'm going to bound this with Hupting's inequality. Now this, now you might think, okay, this might be kind of problematic. Because over there, I have here I have an absolute value. But here, in, my, in Hupting's inequality, I don't have absolute value. You might think, uh-oh, like this might be a problem. But... Here's, I'm going to draw this diagram for you a little bit, uh, which is, I want to, uh, let's say that, so this is not the true distribution of, uh, of Z, but like, let's say that Z kind of looks like something like that, right? Here's the expected value of Z. And then here's like, you know, epsilon above, here epsilon below. And I want to, and so what I want to do is I want to bound the probability of this. One useful trick is that when you don't have the absolute value, what you say is, look, this thing is this probability. But this probability um, actually, um, sorry, I, I think I have it the other way around. This, this probability is this. And Huffing's inequality bounds for me this probability. Right? This is where I can use Huffing. Uh, or I think it's actually greater. Yeah. Yeah, right, wrong. Yeah, okay, greater. Huffing's inequality actually bounds for me only this. <laughs> so, what I'm going to do here instead is I'm going to like to fit this, so there is actually, okay, so I can do one of two things. One is that this probability is the probability that I overshoot. Like I'm outside, like I only went outside this range. The other thing is that here's a, 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 second, a second version is actually, you can do this and you can put a two here. And because I think this probably fits the problem better, I'm going to use this inequality. But the one of the slides is that I take away the two and I take away the absolute value. But effectively, other than that, those two, these two inequalities both hold. But because it, I think it fits this kind of application better, I'm going to use it. Though you might, though I'm going to warn you that in the slides. The absolute value is gone, and so you take away the two. Right. But if you actually look up Huffing's inequality on Wikipedia, they give you this version and the one of the slides. But because I think it will fit this a little better, I'm going to use it in that form. So what is z here? z is equal to 1 over n times the sum like, I, I hope this is not like confusing because these two, like basically using them are exactly the same. 
other than I'm going to use this inequality here, slightly different from the ones in the slides, just because it fits this better. But just be aware that in the slides, you have to take away the absolute value and you can take away the mean. Okay. So there, in the slides, there's no absolute value and there's no two. But if you look on Wikipedia, both of these, both the ones in the slides and this one are both valid. And so Z is equal to this. Now I'm going to bound probability Z minus expected value of Z is greater than or equal to epsilon. So remember, this is still the same thing. This is saying, what's the probability I'm epsilon outside of the like you know permissible range? We want to rewrite this in a certain way. Z is one over n times the sum of the random variables xi minus the expected value, which is we derive as p, the true probability of the of heads. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply both sides of this inequality by n. Notice that doesn't change the inequality. I'm going to keep the same inequality, just multiply both sides by n. So this is equal to the probability, multiply both sides by n. And why did I do this? Because if you look at Hufting's inequality, Sn has to be a sum of independent, of mutually independent x1, x2, up to xn. So the reason I did the multiplication by n is so that I can get this thing. Notice how here, this, that's Sn. Really important, x1 up to xn have to be mutually independent. Here, they are mutually independent. They're literally just like, you know, x size are just like, you know, flips of the coins. All of them are mutually independent. So notice here we have checked that Sn is the sum of mutually independent random variables. I believe there's a homework problem where you couldn't actually use Huffington's inequality because the random variables were not mutually independent. Now, what does this, now what does Hufting's inequality guarantee for me here now? This is less than or equal to two times exponential of minus two t squared. What's t? t is here n epsilon okay. over the sum from i equals one to n of bi minus ai. What's bi minus ai? It's just telling you, you know, like bi minus ai is just like a bound of like all, my random variable always takes values inside ai to bi. So all these random variables xi, what values, what values for xi, like like how can like what are like bounds for the random variable xi? Xi can only take on value zero to one. So all of these xi's are bounded from zero to one. I guess xi is either zero or one. So xi is bounded inside this interval, zero, one. Makes sense. Thumbs up, thumbs down, this, this bound. All right. So, so this bi, ai, this ai and bi tell you are just ai, bi tell you my random variable xi only takes values inside between ai to bi. So x1 here, that's the flip of a coin, one for heads, zero for tails. Therefore, x1 lies in between 0 and 1. x2 is another flip of the coin. x2 is 1 for heads, 0 for tails. Therefore, x2 lies between 0 and 1. You can use other values. You can do like, you know, negative 1 to 2 or something. But like, you might as well just make it as small as possible. Right, so all my xi's are just flips of coin, 1 for heads, 0 for tails. And therefore, they are lying in between zero and one. Therefore, all my AIs are zero. All my BIs are one. BI minus AI, one minus zero squared. What is this equal to? This is equal to two times the exponent. Uh, um, I'll pull this up here. Two times the exponential of minus two N squared epsilon squared over 
this thing, that's just one, one plus one plus one n times, that's n. Therefore, this is equal to two exponential negative two, two n epsilon squared. Keep in mind, this is probability of failure, probability of failure less than or equal to this needs to be, so, so that, that means I want this to be less than or equal to delta. Remember, that's my max probability of failure. So this is my true probability of failure, Huffington inequality, less than or equal to this, and I need this to still be less than delta. That way I can really guarantee my probability of failure is really underneath my maximum probability of failure. Now I can solve this. How many n's do I need? Because I'm going to divide. I have a, I have a delta over 2. So I have an exponential negative 2n. All right, I'm going to take the log. All right, I'm going to divide by negative 2 epsilon squared. So that flips the inequality. And I'm going to put this negative into the log. So get this. Notice here that this, by Huffington's inequality, now tells you how many times do I have to flip. Notice you have the same thing. Epsilon is small. That means that I have to be very, very accurate. Epsilon is small. 1 over epsilon squared gets big. Number of flips gets big. Delta is small. That means I have to be really, really certain. I, I can have a very, very low chance of failure. Delta is small. 2 over delta gets big. 2 over delta gets big. The log of a big number is also big. N has to get big. But notice here what the difference is, is that here I did one over delta. You have a one over, you have essentially, you still have one over two epsilon squared times like a one over two delta. But here you have an ln two over delta. So over up there, you had a one over two delta. So that means delta, when delta gets small, you have a, it goes up by one over two delta. Here, it goes up by log of two over delta. So this log is just like, pushing it down, which means that this bound is just way tighter than that bound. So you calculate with Chebyshev's inequality, you would think you would have to flip your coin many, many, many more times. But in fact, you actually have to, you actually have less times, you actually have to flip your coins less times than you thought if you calculate it with Hopkins inequality. What this sort of tells you is that Hopkins inequality is kind of a like, you know, tighter bound on things than, than Chebyshev's inequality. But I'm not going to, go into this too, too much. But like, I just thought this might be a good application of you know, really just showing you like how many times you need to flip a coin to get to be probably approximately right about the probability of heads. All right, I want to give Max time to go over the functions in Carnell. There, there are other things um, related probability that I prepared and you can, you're welcome to ask me after, but I do want to give Max and Tuni time for, for their section as well.